Do you have an infant and are you wondering about what nutrition to focus on for them in the first couple years of life? Today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive specifically into the really important nutrient iron. Welcome to the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. As a pediatrician and mother herself, Dr. Rolnick is here to answer your most pressing parenting questions and guide you through the tough spots. Welcome back to Be Kind Pediatrics. For those of you who are new to the show, my name is Dr. Blair Rolnick. I'm a board-certified pediatrician and mom myself. In the last several episodes, we've been talking all about the role of nutrition and especially its crucial role in the first 1,000 days of life. We talked previously about DHA and choline, but today I really want to focus on iron. So let's jump right in. So iron has several important roles in the first 1,000 days of life for a child. And there's four big roles that I'd like to highlight. One, brain development. Two, red blood cell production. That kind of ties into brain development. We'll talk about why in a second. Three, immune function. and Four, growth. So let's start off with the cognitive neurodevelopment. So red blood cells are made up of several different products, but one of the main products is heme. And we get heme by um, ingesting iron. That's one of the building blocks for our red blood cells. Red blood cells are really vital in that they carry and transport oxygen to all parts of our body, but one big organ that consumes a lot of oxygen is the child's developing brain. Um, and so they have higher iron requirements during this time frame, um, and those iron, iron requirements kind of exponentially increases your child growth. That is one way that iron plays a really crucial role in the first 1,000 days of life. We know from several studies done on children with iron deficiency anemia and those with adequate iron, that compared to children with adequate iron, children with iron deficiency anemia have higher risks or higher association of neurocognitive delays. Um, so they don't seem to do as well as children who are receiving enough iron. And that is when you control for all other um, nutritional deficiencies. So we're talking about children who are just have an iron micronutrient deficiency compared to children who do not. Um, there seems to be a difference in those child's developmental outcomes. Some interesting other facts about development in iron is that we know children um, can have iron deficiency without having anemia. So the AP recommends, and most pediatricians also endorse checking a hemoglobin between nine months of age and ideally 18 months of age. Um, but part of the problem with that policy, in my opinion, is that you can still have an iron deficiency and maintain a normal hemoglobin. At some point, if your iron deficiency is severe enough, you will develop a microcytic anemia, meaning you have very small red blood cells. But if you only know your hemoglobin, you may still be missing an iron um, deficiency. Um, and so it's important also between nine months and 24 months when children are at some of the highest risk for iron deficiency to be checking um, an iron along with that hemoglobin. The other role that iron, um, emergent role that we were discovering that iron plays is in sleep. Even children, again, who have iron deficiency but are not deficient enough to become anemic um, seem to have higher rates of things like restless leg syndrome and periodic move movement syndrome. So actually the treatment for that is iron supplementation. Um, because iron is a really important cofactor that helps our muscles relax when we sleep. So this is one way where, you know, sleep is so intertwined with a child's ability to learn new things. Um, this is one way where iron may be affecting a child's development if they are, if it, if it is in fact affecting their sleep. So I talked about in the beginning that there were four functions of iron, one, um, development, two, carrying oxygen or red blood cell production, and three, immune function. So again, red blood cells pr play a vital role in our immune defense, as does iron itself. Our immune system is super smart, actually, in that iron is important not only for us as human beings, but it's actually really important for bacteria and viruses as well. So that when we get sick, our body actually hides all the iron away um, so that viruses and bacteria cannot use that iron to grow um, and become stronger. So it's actually important that we don't check iron when your child is sick. So if it's in the winter months, it might seem like you can never check their iron because they just have back-to-back -back illnesses. But um, when you're acutely ill, your iron actually, you might have normal stores, but it's kind of hidden away so that when you check a serum iron, it, it looks low and it's not really. But that just speaks to the vital, again, vital role that iron plays in our immune function. 
one of the bigger roles I'd like to highlight for iron is growth. So iron is a really important micronutrient for children's overall growth of both their bones and muscles. Um, and we know children who have microdeficiencies in iron don't grow as well as children who do. So for all of those reasons, why iron is a really crucial micronutrient to talk about in the first thousand days of life with your pediatrician. Also because it's a very common micronutrient deficiency. So unlike microdeficiency, micronutrient deficiencies in things like um, zinc um, and selenium, uh, as well as copper, iron is actually a more common micronutrient deficiency. So let's talk about the micronutrient requirements in the first thousand days of life and where are children getting iron from. So prenatally, babies are getting iron from their mothers. So it is very important for the um, during the prenatal stage for mothers to be getting adequate nutrition. If you have any concerns about as a mother that you're not meeting adequate nutrition either because you're feeling nauseous or you're feeling um, super fatigued, those are reasons to get a registered dietitian who specializes in prenatal care on board to talk about and think about some of these micronutrients, especially iron. So before birth, babies are getting all of their iron from mommy. At birth, we do and we recommend something in pediatrics as well as ACOG, so the um, Society for Obstetricians and Gynecologists here in the United States, recommend delayed cord clamping if possible. If your baby is critically ill and they cannot do delayed cord clamping, obviously, that takes precedence, but in an otherwise healthy um, delivery, the obstetricians will delay cord clamping, meaning they won't clamp the cord at the second that your baby comes out. They will wait a couple minutes. And that is because there's a big transfusion of iron and hemoglobin that happens in those first couple minutes after your baby is born. Um, and so we don't want to prevent that by early cord clamping. So when it is possible, when your baby is well and the mother is well, and it allows for it, we should try to do delayed cord clamping so that babies get that maximum amount of iron. If for some reason there is an emergency, your baby comes out very ill or the mother is very ill and we cannot do delayed cord clamping, that's actually a really important piece of information to share with your pediatrician. So I encourage you to share that information with your pediatrician at your first visit um, because they may want to check an iron earlier on depending on how and, and what you're feeding your baby in those first six to nine months. So birth to six months, babies are getting iron either from formula or breast milk. So formula is iron fortified. It adds iron to meet the nutritional needs of most infants. Um, the exception here is sometimes premature babies or baby NICU babies come out with higher iron requirements and we're adding additional iron onto their, um, either into their formula or into their breast milk. Um, but most babies are going to be fine with uh, just formula fortified iron. Breastfed babies are also going to get iron from breast milk. So again, this is a really important, crucial time for mommies to think about their own nutritional status because your baby is getting your iron through your breast milk. There are small amounts of iron in breast milk, but interestingly, that small amount is more bioavailable, meaning it is more easily absorbed and made available to your baby. So even though there is less of it, they're able to absorb it better. Um, and so for those first six months, again, babies are exclusively getting their iron either from their formula or from their breast milk. Six months and older, or really four months and older, depending on your baby, um, they are going to start to get iron from additional sources. So at that six month mark, your baby has grown exponentially in those first six months. And so their iron requirement actually has gone up because they were bigger. Um, and so now they need to get iron from additional sources. And that typically comes in the form of solid foods. So we did a whole episode on how to introduce solids. I encourage you to refer back to that. Um, but some of the foods I recommended starting early on were iron-rich foods. So those are going to be things like leafy green vegetables, um, um, meats, legumes, and we'll go over a nice selection of iron-rich foods again um, later on in this episode. So just again, a little note here for mommy, since we're talking about where babies get their iron from in the first six months for breastfed babies, it's from moms. So signs that a mom might not have enough iron stores herself um, are definitely fatigue and shortness of breath. If you are feeling either of those things, I really strongly encourage you to reach out to both your practitioner and a registered dietitian to make sure that you are not having any micronutrient deficiencies, one of the most common ones being iron. Okay, so let's talk about good iron sources that you can start as early as four to six months old. So depending on your pediatrician's clearance, you're, you're going to be seen at the four to six month visit. Your pediatrician's going to be looking for signs 
or readiness signs that your baby is ready to start solids. And again, we did a really nice episode on some of those signs, but as long as your baby generally can sit up and they're bringing things to their mouth and they're um, interested in food, you're probably going to start solid somewhere in that four to six months range. Um, and really iron rich foods are going to be, so meats are definitely a great source of heme iron. So let's pause here for a second, just talk about the difference between heme iron and non-heme iron. So heme iron is iron that comes generally from animal products. It's going to be things like meats and eggs. Non-heme iron is our vegetarian forms of iron. So that is going to be breast milk, actually, um, uh, leafy green vegetables and legumes. Heme iron is more easily absorbed than non-heme iron, but that does not mean that you need heme iron. You absolutely can get all of your iron requirements in the form of non-heme iron. You just need a little bit more of it. So for patients out there who are vegan or vegetarian and prefer non-heme iron sources, you absolutely can do that safely. Again, I encourage you to do it with a registered dietitian and your pediatrician because um, you'll just need a little bit more iron, but you absolutely can get all of your iron requirements um, from leafy greens, vegetables, um, and then non-heme non sources. So let's go back to talking about iron-rich foods. So meats are a great source of heme iron as are eggs. Non-heme iron we can get from legumes um, and fed vegetables, especially those dark leafy green vegetables, spinach, kale, etc. So some tips and tricks for optimizing iron absorption, both in yourself and your child. One, you want to take your iron-rich um, foods with vitamin C-rich foods. So you can always pair something leafy green spinach, like a kale smoothie, um, and add in a little bit of orange juice or pear juice. Um, I actually really love pears with high high iron foods because iron can be constipating um, and pears contain sorbitol, which is a natural stool softener um, and they're high in vitamin C. So they actually increase your iron absorption and they help mitigate some of the constipation and tummy issues that we see with iron supplementation and iron in general. So you can do a kale pear smoothie. Um, you can do mix like spinach, blend some kale or spinach into your hummus and add bell peppers. They're also a great source of vitamin C. So vitamin C and iron go really nicely together. If you're taking iron supplements, so if your child has iron deficiency, their iron deficiency anemia or non-anemic iron deficiency, you might want to consider asking your physician about every other day dosing. So actually taking an iron supplementation every day reduces the absorption of iron. But if you do it every other day, that actually maximizes the absorption of iron. Um, and so you might need to look to supplement a little bit less if you're boosting your absorbency. And it has less GI side effects to do every other day. So you're getting less side effects and you're increasing your iron absorption. There was a really nice study that demonstrated every other day dosing boosts our absorption. So that's one little trick um, or two little tricks. Um, and then a third trick is to avoid things that inhibit iron absorption. So the big one for children we're talking about here is cow's milk and dairy. Dairy seems to cause a little bit of inflammation in our colon, which is also called colitis. And that is where iron is absorbed. So if you have inflammation there, you're not absorbing iron optimally. Um, and so that is why we actually recommend that you limit the amount of um, dairy in taking your child to less than 24 ounces, because more than that, puts you at risk for iron deficiency anemia and some of those poor neurocognitive outcomes we discussed. Additionally, that is why we don't recommend starting cow's milk until you are at least one um, because of that iron deficiency risk. So avoid dairy. You also want to avoid things like tannins. Not that many children are drinking tannic rich things, but tea for adults, you don't want to take your iron with um, things like tea. Um, Lastly, you can also look for enriched foods with iron. Um, I forgot to mention that, but, but you can take look for things that actually have iron added into them. That typically is grain. So rices and cereals can be fortified with iron and can be a nice source, um, especially for those selective eaters. So just to recap, iron's role for the first thousand days of life really has to do with brain development, sleep, growth, immune function, red blood cell production. Um, and in the first six months, you're really getting your iron either from breast milk or formula. After that, you're getting it from food. You can get it from both vegetarian and non-vegetarian foods. If you're getting it from vegetables, just be aware that you need a little bit more and do that in conjunction with a professional. Overall, I hope you found today's episode really helpful. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, as always, please leave them below. 
Thank you for watching the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. For more episodes and her practice, visit BeKindPediatrics.com and don't forget to subscribe for more parenting tips wherever you get your podcasts. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Always seek medical advice from a qualified physician.